Good morning. How are we doing? Been okay? So-so? It's a good day. You know, uh, I started my Spanish service saying exactly the same thing Brad said. I was like, man, he took my line. What do what, what I say now? Well, it is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, right? I hope you understand the decision there. I will rejoice. You got to make a decision to rejoice today. You're in the house of the Lord, and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. Hey. <laughs> well, we're going to talk a little bit this morning, and we're going to be in Matthew 6, verse 33. If you have your Bibles, open it there. Just keep your finger there, because that's where we're going to be all morning, Matthew 6, 33. So it's going to be an easy one for, for Bible uh, verses today. We live in a, in a country of options, right? They call it the land of opportunity, right? And I'm glad that we live here. I, for one, love the opportunities and the options, but there's so much to do here, so much to have, so many things fighting for our time and for our, for our talent and for our treasure, right? How so many things. We're getting bombarded continuously, and you mix to this the idea of raising a family, and life can get a little, just a little complicated, doesn't it? Just a little bit. It's no wonder why millennials now, they're waiting longer and longer to get married, they're saying, no, man, I got to wait. But for those of us that decided that we're going to have a family and we're going to go and try at this thing, uh, we got a lot in our hands. We got a lot of decisions to make. And sometimes we wonder, how in the world are we supposed to do all of this? How, how do we go about this thing of raising a family? And that's what we're trying to cover in this series that we call uh, Family Goals. Okay, we're trying to, to look at things that a family needs and, and try to help understand what can we do to raise this family the way God wants us to do it. And today, I'm going to talk a lot about parenting, but I want you to make sure if, if you're here and you don't have a kid, this message is for you too. Okay, so you're not, not permitted to tune out today. This message is for you too. So, what, But one of the most important, Challenging things in marriage and for marriage is parenting. That's one of the most challenging things. I mean, here, here you have this little person comes into your life, disrupts your whole life, right? Wants all your attention. And you have to think about, you're supposed to, to you know, guide, instruct, defend, protect, provide, train this little person with no training, Nobody tells you what to do, really. It's like, oh, we're so happy you have a kid. Good luck. <laughs> you know, and see, I mean, I had our first one was like, all right, now what? <laughs> but one of the toughest decisions when you have kids is how to prioritize. You know, we have so many options here. You got sports, you got music, you got education. Nowadays, they put them in, they don't put them in daycare. They put them in early learning centers. Because by 2, they need to read and write. By 12, they're graduating from high school. And by 18, you have a doctorate. All right, so that, that's priorities right there, right? <laughs> but we have so many things to do with them, right? Financial management, decisions to make, and the list can go on and on and on. You know, for me as a new father, and, and at that time, I really wasn't walking with the Lord. You know, I'm talking uh, a long time ago. But my kids were born into a household where we really weren't, walking with God. And for me, one of the important things when we moved here to the United States, you know, I did experience some racism, you know. I don't experience it that much anymore, but back in 85, you kind of saw it everywhere you went. I remember, uh, well, I won't go there. Anyways, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm going on a rabbit trail right there. It's like, why? <laughs> but one of the things I did with my kids is, hey, I want you to make sure that you're proud of who you are. I want to make sure you're proud of being a Latino man. I want to make sure you're proud of being a Santiago. You know, I used to tell them, remember, you're a Santiago. They're not here. I can't point at them. But, but, so I, I always had that. It, and it was like, listen, you're going to do your work in such a way that when people look at it, they say, man, that must have been Joel. That must have been Gabriel. Or that must have been Ricky who did that. Because only a Santiago can do it that well. And, you know, a couple of them took it seriously. So serious, they tattooed it in their body, bodies. Look at, look at a picture I got from the. You got the picture of the tattoos? 
Oh, there you go. You see, that, that's taking it seriously, man. I made the point. <laughs> but <laughs> I hope in all seriousness that you see the arrogance of what I was teaching my kids. I was teaching them, you do your work in such a way that people know you're mine. I don't think that's what God says in the Bible, right? Look at what God says in Matthew 5, 16. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see, I was teaching my kids the wrong priority. It was do things so people can praise me instead of teaching them to do things so people can see their good works and glorify their Father who is in heaven. So how do, we, how do we help our children? How do we help those around us put God first? That is the question we want to answer today. How do we help those around us put God first? I think Matthew 6, gives us a lot of insight into this question. Read it with me. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I think it's worth reading again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We all know that verse, right? I don't think we all apply it, but we all know it. And to be fair to you and to, to allow you to understand this, Jesus was not talking about parenting when he mentioned this verse. Okay? Uh, to give you the context, Jesus was really talking about worrying. You know, people were worried about what we're going to dress like, what we're going to eat, what we're going to do. And Jesus said, listen, don't worry about it. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Today you have enough issues going on. So don't worry about it. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Okay, so he wasn't talking exactly about parenting, but what he is talking about is prioritizing. He is talking about prioritizing. You see, and this is the thing. And I hope you hear the call in this verse. God calls you and God calls me to seek him. He is calling us to seek him. Now, now we have many things that we're seeking in this world, right? We, we have to seek after education and seek after a job. And we, we got to provide for our family and we need employment and we need relationships and all that stuff. And when it comes to our kids, it comes with a lot of complications, schooling and daycares and, and all these other things. There's a lot to seek, but God is saying, listen, I know these things. I know everything you need. I know everything your kids need. You just seek me. This is, John MacArthur calls it the Christian's priority of priorities. I love that. The Christian's priority of priorities should be to seek God. You know, God knows exactly what we need. And even though he knows, he doesn't say, go get a better employment. Go get a better wife. Or go get a better husband. He says, just seek me. And not only seek me, but he says, seek me first. First. The priority of priorities. God wants us to seek him first. I love sports. And if you know me, there are two sports that I like, mostly. Basketball and baseball, right? Why? Because in Puerto Rico, we grew up with basketball and baseball. That was it. There was no soccer. There was no football. As a matter of fact, when I was a teenager, one of my friends who was studying in American school in Buchanan in the, in the base came home with a football. And we looked at that thing and said, what in the world can you do with that? <laughs> he was the only one that knew what to do with the ball. <laughs> We're like, how do you do anything with this thing? Anyways, so I love baseball. I love basketball. And... and 
you know, when one time Xiaomi and I were driving when my kid, my oldest kid was five years old, we were driving down the street in Sheridan and by Pasadena Lakes, we see this sign, T-Ball. And I had no idea what T-Ball was, but it said the kid can start playing T-Ball at five years old. I'm like, goodness, really? I put my kid right in. I said, let's, let's play some T-Ball. By the time I got to my third kid, he started at three years old. I mean, this was fantastic, right? We live in the park anyway, so might as well start him at three. Before he could walk or say anything, I mean, he was swinging a bat. But, but they loved, they, they, to make a long story short, they fell in love with the game of baseball and the game of basketball. All three of my kids play both sports. They play basketball right here at Hollywood Christian School. Uh, my oldest played baseball right here at Hollywood Christian School. My youngest played for Flanagan, went to play for college, and today he's a, a baseball coach in South Carolina in a college up there. It's fantastic. They love the sport. They love both sports. But my question to you this morning is why? Why is it that my sons love baseball and basketball? Because I did. See, and what I sought after, they did too. See, my sons loved those two specific sports because I showed them the passion that I had for those two specific sports. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. I'm really not talking about sports here. What I'm trying to say is God has given you and me a call. A call to follow him, to seek him, and to seek him first. And if you show with passion that you're seeking God, guess what your kids are going to do? They're going to seek God as well. See? So I guess the question then becomes, what is the passion in your life? If I was to ask your son, your daughter, your nephew, your niece, your grandkids, what's her passion or what's his passion? What would they say? I actually did the test with my granddaughter last night, but I'm not going to tell you the answer because the parents are not here, so I'm not going to talk about them. But what would they say is your passion? Is it football on Sunday mornings? Or maybe football on Friday nights and Saturday and then Sunday. What is your passion? What are you seeking after? And let me tell you, if the answer to this question is anyone or anything but God, you're on the wrong track. We have to seek God, but we have to seek him First, and we need to seek him first. Why? Because he wants us to seek him with all of our heart. We want to seek God. We must seek God with all of our heart. He needs to be our top priority. And God established that in his word, that he is to be the top priority. I know you read it last week with Pastor Brian, but Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's one God. One. So you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Now, you can say, well, Jose, that says, hear Israel. It doesn't say, hear Jose. But we know that this applies to us as well, because in Mark 12, 30, Jesus said, this is the first and greatest commandment. We need to love the Lord our God with all we've got. He needs to be our priority, our number one priority in our list. You got to seek him with all you have. And this means to, to, to lose yourself in obedience to the Lord. It's, it's giving up of yourself for the work that God has called you to do. It's forgetting everything else and, and just following him with all that you got. 
Paul said it in Acts 20, 24. He says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. You know, we have that problem in this society today. We think we're better than anything. You know, we look ourselves at a mirror. <laughs> Yesterday, I was watching something. I don't know, some ad came, or I think it was the news last night. They were talking about this girls' club thing that they're doing in Miami. And they are teaching these girls. Remember how we used to say, come sit at the table and, and, and fellowship with us, right? Everybody used to use that word, come sit at the table. Let's sit at the table. They tell these girls, no, you don't have to go sit at the table. You create your own table. And if everybody wants to be with you, they can come to your table. I'm like, whoa, how things have changed. Listen, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You see, this is, this is the deal. When you seek him with all your God, when you seek him with all your passion, your children will seek him also. That's it. We can put all kinds of excuses here, but that's the bottom line. Now, obviously, this is not a guaranteed statement, okay? Many of us have seek God with all our hearts and our kids have gone the other way. So it's not a guarantee. But this is what I'm going to guarantee to you this morning. If you do not seek God with all your heart, your children will not seek him also. That I can guarantee you. That is a guarantee. Now the verse goes on to say that we must seek God, but we must seek his righteousness as well. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? What does it mean to seek the righteousness of God, okay? This means to set our minds on things above. It means to, to, to look up and set our minds on God instead of setting our minds in the world and what's around us. It's conducting ourselves in the middle of all the circumstances as a child of God. You know, you have to give your kids an example to follow. But in order to do that, you have to believe it. you got to be passionate about it. Second Peter 3 said, since all these things, what is he talking about? Things of the world. He says, since all these things, the things of the world, are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? See, Seeking God's righteousness is to behave in such a way that it demonstrates the holiness and the godliness of our God. That's what it is. And you know, many of us do very well on Sunday morning. You know, we come here, we look good, we smile. I mean, we, we go all out. But on Monday, our mouth by noon needs a washing. You know what I'm saying? And what we show, and sometimes it's not even Monday. Sometimes Sunday afternoon at home. And what we're showing our kids is really how to lose my temper, how to, how to curse, and how to be nice on Sunday morning so that nobody knows. Look at the verse again. But seek first. Seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So you see, as we seek God, as we teach our children to seek God, we can live with the confidence that God is going to give you all our needs. Now he's talking about needs, not wants. Sometimes we confuse those two. I want a car, but God is not giving it to me. So it must be this or that or the other. No, no, no. He said, if you seek my kingdom and my righteousness, all these things that you need 
will be taken care of. So if I do that and I teach my kids to do that, I know they're going to be taken care of. So we got to help lose the things of this world, people. We're holding them too tight. They're going to be dissolved, said Peter there. Dissolved. They're going to go away. The missionary Jim Elliot said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You're not a fool if you let him go. You're not a fool if you're, face, if you're, if you're putting as your priority in your life, God. And all of us need to do just that. Not only for our children's sake. You know, when, when we do children presentations up here and we do family dedications, what are we covenanting to, to with them? We're saying we as a church are coming together with you to help you parent this child, to make sure that he walks in the walk that he needs to go. And so if we do that, whether you have a kid this morning or not, it doesn't matter. Your life is an example to somebody in this group. And we all should follow God first, make him our priority, seek his righteousness, so that when people see us, they can glorify our Father who is in heaven. See, God calls you and me to be a leader and an example. God has called you and me to be a leader and an example. So mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts and grandpas and grandmas and everybody else, every mature Christian who has an opportunity to impact the life of a child, we must behave in a way that shows who is our priority. Paul said in Corinthians, and I love it, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, be imitators of me. Why? Because I am imitating Christ. See, it's easy to tell my kid, listen, you have to do this, that, and the other. And don't worry about what I do. I'm the adult in the family, so I do whatever I want. You just, you just do what I'm telling you to do. It's easy to do that. Do as I say, not as I do, kind of thing. You know what's going to happen? Your kid is going to end up doing what you do. And he's going to tell his kid the same exact thing. No, you do this, this, and this. My father said to do it. I think it's a good idea, so you do it, but I'm going to do this other stuff. Paul is reversing this thing and saying, no, 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 no. Listen, Joel, listen, Gabriel, Ricky, just look at me. You want to know how to live a godly life? You look at me, and you do what I'm doing. Because I'm doing what Jesus did. This is a huge responsibility, but it is our responsibility. Show them. Take it. Nowadays, they have to take to your kid to work day. Take him to work on Monday and show him how a Christian works. Show him how a Christian reacts when another employee or a customer cusses you out. Show him, if you're a business owner, how to be an honest business owner that glorifies God with everything he does. Be an example to your kids. Show them how a Christian relates to other people. And listen, watch out what you say about other people in front of your kids. I've talked to kids here sometimes at Hollywood Christian School. And you wouldn't believe what comes out of their mouth from what I, they heard their mom or their dad say about somebody. You're a Christian, and if you are, you better be very careful what you say when they're listening to you. Show them how you honor God in the way you spend your money. Show them in the way that you, you give to the church and to charities. Show them. You know, one, one of the biggest regrets I have, one of the biggest mistakes I made, and, and, you know, we all make them. I was just growing on my Christian walk. It was the first few years I was coming back to church and getting into it. And I think in the first two years, I must have read the whole Bible like three times, which is fantastic. I recommend it to anybody. But I did it with the door closed in my office in my house. 
I didn't want any interruptions. My kids learned that when that door was closed, you couldn't even knock, you know, coming in. So they knew something was happening with daddy. Man, daddy became a maniac. Now he's, all he does is read this Bible, and he's in there, and we're out here, and we don't have anybody to play with. But one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't do it with them. I didn't sit with them to help show them how I was eating up the word of God and the passion that had come over me. Listen, be an example of your passion for God in every aspect of your life in front of your kids. Let them see you praying. Let them, let them see you reading the word. And I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, but pastor, I just don't understand that when I read this. How, how can I explain? Don't worry about that. Show him that you need to read it. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need at the time you need it. Trust me on that. He will. And he might teach you through them. Yeah. So how, how do we do this? How, how do we put some practical stuff? I, I just have two things. First of all, I call the faith at home routines. Faith at home routines. Listen, sit down and read the Bible with your kid, with your son, with your daughter, with your grandson, granddaughter. Sit and read the Bible with them. Decide a time of the day and just sit and do it. Let them see you reading the Bible. Let them ask questions. You ask him questions. So what do you think about that? What does it say about God? What does it say about us? How do you think we can apply this to our life? Simple questions. And just let them give you whatever answer. The answer really doesn't matter. What matters is that you're making them think about the word of God. Have a time to prayer with them. Sit down and pray. Let them see you cry over things. Let them see you beg God over things. And show them that when they're in difficulty, man, we get on our knees, man, and we pray. Show them. Do it in front of them. Listen, bring them to church with you. And I know the statistics say that nowadays people come to church twice a month. Man, twice a month. That's only 26 Sundays a year. What do you think an hour and 15 minutes for 26 Sundays? I don't know how many hours is that, like 30 hours? A year are going to do for your spiritual life. Not much. If that's all you're getting, it's not going to do much. What do you think it's going to do for your child's life? Not much. They spend seven hours a day in the school for 180 days. You can do the math. How many hours is that? And they're being influenced for the other team right there in school. And then they get an hour and 15 minutes every other Sunday, and they're supposed to be these Christian kids. You understand what I'm saying? Faith at home routines. I'm telling you, it's one of the things I regretted the most. I wish somebody, the first day I accepted the Lord, said, this is what you got to do with your kids, man, now that they are six and seven. But I waited until they were 13 and 14. And it's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> the second thing I'm going to suggest is that you do some love at home habits. So do routines that show them your faith and then have habits that show them the love that you have. Set rules for them respecting one another. Have you ever been to a house where there's a couple of kids and all they do is fight and call each other names? And oh my goodness, and they're jealous of each other. I hate when that happens. I hate it. When my kids wanted to fight, I said, well, we got gloves. We got a punching bag. So if you want to fight, we're going to fight. We're going to fight for fun, too. And I will put the gloves on, set up a ring. Let's go. I got the clock. Let's fight. That's the only fighting that I allowed in my house. You want to fight? Okay, let's go to the ring. Oh, no, no, no. We don't want to put the gloves. No. Then stop fighting. If you want to hit something or somebody, go hit that punch bag. I got a 75-pound punch bag in my garage that nobody uses now. <laughs> but they used to hit it plenty, plenty. 
love at home habits. Show him to treat others with love and with respect. Show him to share. Kids now, they don't, they don't know how to share. I got a one-year-old granddaughter. If I put something on the floor, you know who wants it? She wants it so bad that she walks for it. She, she's like, I want that bad. <laughs> we don't need to teach them to be selfish. They already know. They come, it comes with the package. <laughs> we need to teach them to share. We need to teach them to love. That, that's the Christian way, right? Show them Christian love in action. And I know this applies to everyone, but listen, starts at home. We got to do it at home. If you don't do it at home, what you do outside really doesn't matter. It's obedience. This is obedience to the Lord's command. In John 13, 34, he said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, not however you want, but just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. See, without good routines, without good habits, firmly planted in our children, it will be impossible for them to seek God first. It's going to be impossible. They're bombarded all day long by all kinds of things. You know, um, everybody here probably knows my grandson, Sean. Sean is 11 years old. He's in middle school now. He just realized this week that he has less and less friends. It's pretty interesting to, to understand the why. He came to his mother the other day and said, Mom, I'm sad. And she said, why? Because I just lost another friend today. And she said, what's going on? Why? Well, I don't like kids that curse. I don't like kids that treat other people bad. And this one kid the other day saw for him a vape. And he said, no, I don't like people that smoke that thing either. Man, I was so happy. <laughs> I said, buddy, I said, Crystal, you make sure you tell him that's exactly what he needs to be doing. Stay away from them and keep living the Christian life. Sean loves the Lord. He's a crazy kid. He'll drive you nuts. In two minutes flat. But he loves the Lord. And he wants to hang out with people that behave in a certain way. And I told him yesterday, I said, yeah, that's going to cost you to have less friends. But you have good friends. And we need to differentiate into, between those. Listen, one hour a week is not enough. Brothers and sisters, let's, let, let's not be lazy. Let's call it what it is. Sometimes we get lazy. We work too hard. I understand. Let's not be lazy. Let's fight the fight. Let's have a plan of action so that our children, our marriage, our relationships will be all grounded in the righteousness and the love of our Heavenly Father. It takes work. But I know this. If I was to ask each and every one of you, do you want your children, your wife, your neighbor to be happy? We all say what? Yes. Even though some of us have a neighbor that we don't want him to be happy, but that's another message. <laughs> but we all want our kids to be happy, right? The things I did when my kids were growing up, I did it for them. And I made a lot of mistakes, unfortunately. I wanted to give them everything I didn't have. I wanted them to be happy. I didn't never wanted them to be sad. And we all do this with, 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 with great joy. And we, and we try our best. But if you want your kids to be happy, can I give you the secret right now for your kid to be happy? Actually, I'm going to give you the secret for you to be happy. Do you want to be happy today? Okay. Psalm 1. Verse 1 starts with the word happy. That word blessed is happy. 
Happy is the man, and this is man or woman, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor seats in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, happy is the man that reads the word of God and meditates on it all day long. Right? And what happens to that person? Check it out. Woo! Verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. I want to have happy and prosperous children, don't you? I want to be happy and prosperous. What do you have to do? Stay in the word of God. Meditate on it day and night. And let God do the rest. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And if you do that, all these things will be added unto you. Now, I know some of us are late in the game, right? Your kids are grown. My kids are 34, well, next month, this month, in a few days, 34, 33, and 26. And you might say, well, my kids are out of my house, you know. First, two, two things. First of all, I don't want you to feel guilty for what you didn't do. Okay? This advice I gave you today, I didn't follow much of it when I was growing in the faith and when my kids were little, unfortunately. Don't beat yourself up today because it's amazing how God does what he does with the broken vessels we give him. You know, just make sure that your kids follow God, that they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they understand their need for a Savior and leave the rest to God. For many years, I felt guilty for not doing what I should have done with my kids when they were little. Don't feel guilty this morning. Just confess it, repent of it, and give it to God. God knows your heart. He knows that I did the best I could with what I knew at that time. And he forgives you. And he can turn him around in a heartbeat. And we have the confidence that he can. The second thing I'm going to tell you is this. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Start today. Okay? What you did before doesn't matter. We can't do anything about it. You can't change it. But if you're listening to this this morning and you say, oh my goodness, I've never put God first in my life. I don't have these habits. Start today. Today. Don't waste time. Don't wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow's another. No, 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 no. Start today. Say, God, forgive me that you haven't been the priority of priorities in my life. But starting today, you are. Make him the priority in your life. And as you do, as you follow him with all your passion, those around you will see your works. And you know what they're going to do? Glorify your Father who is in heaven.